Welcome back to Why Blank Lost for Big Brother 26. I'm David Bloomberg, and I'm very glad the janky world is over. Join me in singing the song. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, joining me from another secret location is, of course, my co-host, Ovi Kabir. Hello, David. I'm very glad Janky World is done because watching this entire week, I felt like I was right there with them. Um, and it's a sad week, you know, as many of us know what happened this week. And I feel like uh, it's probably karma. I reveled in David's pain this last week. And unfortunately, this week between Janky and my winner pick going home, it might be what I deserve. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was, you know. Uh, now, I, of course, would never, ever gloat about never. you losing your winner pick. Uh, so I will not I will not sink to those levels, um, you know. But, uh, but, yeah, you know, you did deserve it. So uh, <laughs> I was so excited. I felt like I had a good pathway to actually now – Put some distance between David and I. I, you know, I, I thought I still beat him over a week, but at this point, it's a it's a toss up. We might have to pick some new ones, honestly. So uh, it, it's it's uh, unfortunate it rolled the dice this way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all through the week, leading right up till the votes, it either didn't look like T Core would go, or it was up in the air. Uh, but they finally made a decision and they stuck to it, um, which actually kind of sounds like T-Core's gameplay through most of the season now that I think about it. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Uh, the interesting thing to me was that even without the AI arena, there was still mystery heading into this mm -hmm. week's live eviction episode. For sure. I mean, this week, it was kind of the one of the things, and, and we'll get into, but it was the perfect week for chaos to actually happen. I mean, with Janky Week, which watching it was difficult to watch, and I think being in it would be even more difficult, but it's one of those situations where, you know what, normal situations can go all awry because you have everyone crammed in one room, the negotiating to try to figure out who goes home. Somebody can overhear that easily. You get to see who's talking about it. So it's a straight up, you know, uh, one box full of people. And then also we had the double veto. So you had the ability to basically get yourself an ally out. I mean, if it was one week that you could, you know, hope that you're on the block, this would probably be one of the weeks for it. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that it would be slow. I mean, it was slower. That it was less likely something would happen because they were all trapped there together. And, you know, that someone who might be a surprise could see what was going on. We'll get to more of that later. Um, but when we get to that, uh, what we will do, as always, is look at how T-Core uh, did in comparison to my rules for winning that I wrote way back 20 years ago in 2004 and have modified ever since. Uh, we will analyze her actions using what we saw on TV, live feeds, interviews, and other information. And of course, the most recent version of those rules are at robhaswebsite.com slash bigbrotherrules. Now, we usually have some other things to discuss about the week in general, and even in janky world, we do. Uh, first is something I never thought I'd be saying. But it looks like Mackenzie's eyes have opened and not, you know, like that, but uh, um, have opened to the game going on around her. And she's actually correctly seeing where people stand and taking actions to deal with that. Uh, you know, as she did here, she stood firm that t -Core had to go. She was one of the main reasons that it happened. Now, we'll see if that continues and if she you know, makes moves that are beneficial to herself. I feel like it was just a few weeks ago we were talking about Mackenzie does not know where to aim her, you know, her strength, what she's mm -hmm. doing. She's just kind of playing through it, and she's finding a way to connect with people. And this week she really came to, I mean, the strategy was there mm -hmm. and really seeing, like, hey, what is the threat level? And her going to bat, I mean, she was a catalyst for this change to happen because she understood where the lines were drawn. I mean, I think if there's ever a week where the equity – of a winner can mm -hmm. be emerged. It, it's this week for McKenzie. I mean, it was fun watching her play. I mean, and this is one of those weeks where it's some weeks we talk about somebody going home. It's because of their own doing some weeks is somebody else's doing uh, this week. It was a mixture of yeah. both because we got to see players really strategize. Yep. Yep. Now, meanwhile, a couple people, um, they're doing things that aren't beneficial to themselves. Uh, that would be Cam and Chelsea with their ongoing little spat. Uh, so far, it hasn't directly impacted game decisions. I mean, there's been 
I would say indirect, uh, you know, maybe in the decision for T-Core, but directly, I don't think it has. And Chelsea has insisted it won't. But at some point, like Cam is going to get sick of being treated in what he believes is an unfair matter. Um, it, it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in this relationship where it's that you, what we've seen in the past, Chelsea's kind of left Cam out of the vote, her closest ally, she says, multiple times, and he makes sure to, you know, ensure her will of the game goes forward. He does not want to do a move that he thinks would be negative towards her game mm -hmm. versus her game comes first, which, again, I'm not arguing against. I think, actually, her game should always come before anybody else's. Right. The issue is, is she expects Cam to treat her in a way when she doesn't treat him in that way as an ally. So it's strange because I think, I mean, eventually, if the episode comes out, Chelsea uh, it loses. Uh, emotions, I think, are controlling Chelsea in a way, in a manner when she is interacting with Cam. I think there might be a little bit of crush going on here that mm -hmm. you don't see her interacting in a different way with other people. So yeah. I think those feelings are making her, you know, uh, maybe be less strategic than typically she might be. Yeah. All right. Well, I didn't find anything in particular to discuss for our usual segment on, you know, uh, Julie Chen Moonves is wrong about blank. Other than I pointed out on Twitter yesterday, she said they've been in janky world more than a week. No, it was literally less than a week. It was like two hours less than a week. I don't know where you get more than a week from. Uh, but, um, <laughs> uh, that went up on Hamster Watch's goof tally. So, you know, uh, I contributed there. Uh -huh. uh, do you have anything or anyone else that you want to discuss before we move to the rules? The only thing I will say, I think it, sometimes you got a ball in your hand and you just keep throwing it at us, hoping it'll break. It'll be a carnival game. And it just keeps bouncing back at you. For me, that is Angela. Week in and week out, I have been gaveling saying, you know, Angela will get her come up and she'll get her judgment. She will find somebody will see, the, you know, Angela just is going to shouldn't be in this house anymore. Right. Uh, she's she's so this and that. She proves me wrong. She's been entertaining. She strategic, mm, strategic in a way that she somehow yeah. gets her strategy to work. You know, I don't know how it works. She gets a way to work. And at this point, I'm starting to, you know, instead of throwing the ball. I'm thinking about joining the train because Angela now has convinced me there's a chance that we talked about it. If she's in the final two, we said she might be dragged there. And I said she might have a chance to win it. We kind of talked about it. I think Angela right now might be a front runner. A front runner? Okay, front that, runner. that's crazy. Um, that's insane. Bro, that, it, it, <laughs> they respect her game. They I don't mean, respect it, her game. They, she, she finds <laughs> they, a way. She is a mom of force. You. He's a hurricane. Yeah. It's like a natural disaster. Yeah. It's coming. You yes. can't do nothing about it. You hide. You run from it. But it's going to tear it down. That's Angela. She is that. So that is my uh, my opinion of the week on players. I think <laughs> Angela right now, she might be a front runner. David no. disagrees. No. No, I, I said last week, and I got a little flack, I said she had a 0% chance of winning, okay? People were like, well, there's a chance. There's a chance. I think there's a whatever chance. Now, I should note, I didn't say a 0.00%. Mm -hmm. So that means it could go up to point, you know, 0.49% before moving up to 1%. So I will give you. 0.49%. She has four, a 0.49% no. chance of winning. See, that's what we all Which rounds down to zero. The hurricane's going to come for us afterwards. Right. She's going to break through this. We won't ever be able to do. I am predicting we might not be able to ever do a podcast on Angela because she might not lose. She just might not. <laughs> but what do I know? My winner pick just went home. So <laughs> who am I to pick? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. No. 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 Um, so, you know, I could just be like all those uh, people who do projections, whether it's the weatherman or the pollsters, and they can say any percentage they want, because even if it happens, you could say there's a 5% chance of this happening. Mm -hmm. And if it happens, they go, oh, well, it was part of that 5%, you know, but, you know, point, point 0.49 is all I'm willing to give. So David's a Nate Silver of Big Brother right here. He's got oh, his God. percentages yeah. right here, and he he's running them. He's running the tally, 0.49. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get to the rules, uh, I want to mention, of course, that there's the survivor version, which is available in a shorter and much more colorful 
uh, poster form. Uh, go to robhaswebsite.com slash YX Lost Feed. Scroll down to the poster, click on it, order it, and it'll be delivered to you. In addition to the poster, you can also get the poster on a T-shirt and the checklist on a T-shirt, which is closer, but not exact, the uh, Big Brother rules. We've talked about that. So, again, if you want it, it's robhaswebsite.com slash YX Lost Feed. Decor seemed to have an invisible shield around her for much of the game. People saw her there. They knew how they felt about her. They worried she could beat anyone at the end. And sometimes she blew up their games and stabbed them in the back. But it didn't matter. They couldn't stay mad, and they wouldn't nominate her. It looked like she might fly to the end on the wings of angels. Until finally, a series of circumstances almost forced Leah to put her on the block. And even then, supposedly only as a pawn. What finally got people to act on what they saw? At RHAP, we know reality TV, and we know why t lost. The first and most important rule is to scheme and plot. And there's no doubt that t did her fair share of this in instances where she wanted to change the game in her favor. Uh, the biggest example, of course, was when she and Kimo flipped the vote uh, against Cedric to keep Rubina because of information they'd received from Quinn, but which he didn't know they were going to, you know, use without him. Uh, but there were also other times, perhaps more times, where her strategic game was not the greatest. This tended to happen more when it involved situations specific to herself as opposed to others, such as joining Five Points or Sixth Avenue or whatever alliance to play both sides, but then realizing she really didn't want to work with those people and, and would rather have been with people she could be better friends with. As she said at the time, she just wanted to keep Rubina. She didn't want to work with a bunch of people she doesn't like. In the end, her one true alliance was Kimo and Rubina, which, you know, we'll, we'll discuss further throughout at least a couple of rules later, I suspect. Yeah, it's interesting because t -Core, she really played a game of principles in a way where she stuck to how she wanted to strategize. Who she mm -hmm. liked, she strategized with them well. And for people who she didn't really like, she'd throw a bone here in the initial weeks. You know, she tried here and there, right. but she didn't care to play a game of strategy from an advantage or disadvantage. What it mattered to her was the people she liked around her, she'd work with. Again, as uh, you know, as players, I think for Rabina and Kimo, that made them really like feel her, be strong to her. For players like Chelsea, she appreciated that because they're like, wow, this is somebody mm -hmm. loyal who's not like you know, going back and forth, really. She was able to play this game of middle really well for quite a bit of times in which people felt that it was a sincere relationship she made. She did. The issue was is that when it started to dwindle, the numbers of people around her saw that the contrast of T-Core working with them versus working with somebody else was very big versus other players around her. They could see them have certain connections still there. So... You know, in one way, I appreciate the way she played the game. But at the same time, this is a type of strategy that long lasting doesn't always go forward because you see, are seen as the head of the snake. Yeah. And as the game went on, it seemed like it got more and more difficult for her to really strategize. You know, we frequently saw her and the other two talking and talking and talking, but not actually doing. Uh, it became a joke uh, among especially live feed viewers. The biggest of these situations was when Tikor and Kimo knew that Leah was bad mouthing Quinn to others, but he fully trusted her. They kept saying they were going to talk to him and spill all the beans, and then they'd eventually talk to him and not say anything. But then they'd promise to each other that they'd do it the next time, and so on. As one of my notes, uh, you know, that I take said. T Core and Chemo continue to just talk and talk and talk without taking action. And then to make it worse, when she finally did talk to Quinn, she still didn't tell him everything she could have. And even admitted it later. She walked out of there and then later she's like, Yeah, I should have told him these other things. And then 
She wondered why Quinn didn't listen to her and abandon Leah. Of course, this was not the only time it happened where she knew information and didn't properly convey it, but then got upset that the other person didn't somehow just magically know her thoughts on their own. It's interesting when you bring up with Quinn and her relationship and kind of that trio, uh, because I think that's a perfect example with her relationship with Quinn. When Quinn initially, too, came to her talking about different alliances and giving that information, her reaction was instead of saying, I can work with Quinn and we can figure out something else versus to go back and say, hey, actually, these people, Quinn's working with other people. Can we trust Quinn? Um, so she already made kind of this assumption or this decision yeah. in her mind that she doesn't want to work with Quinn. So any information, valuable or not valuable, she will not utilize to create the relationship and make it bigger. She's going to utilize those that information to kind of secure the bond she already has with other people. So, again it creates really strong tight bonds with players mm-hmm. there, which we saw Kimo, Rubina, even Chelsea were ready to kind of die for a game when it probably wasn't the best in some of their situations, but other players could see that. And you can't just strategize really well with certain players. You got to do it against the whole grain. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you know, sometimes lying low, not causing a ruckus by passing along every piece of information, you know, which they didn't, they, they, they didn't do those things. Um, can actually work out because then you don't draw attention. But as the game went on, it meant t missed opportunities to make the game board more favorable towards herself. A perfect example was that she talked about how the trio should pick up Leah after Quinn was evicted. And it really was a great opportunity since Chelsea and company were the ones who orchestrated it and blindsided Leah. But instead of doing that, she didn't, you know. Um, you know. Meanwhile, Chelsea and others had talked to Leah both before and after the eviction and got her enough on their side. Again, thinking about taking an action isn't good enough. You need to fight for your spot to convince people to keep you. But as Leah was debating what she would do, t barely barely did anything. Then after t two closest allies were nominated, she was still just kind of meh about it. Even telling Rubina that if she won veto and Leah nominated t yeah, she was okay with that. It, eventually, she did talk to Leah, but she had a crappy argument with lots of her typical mm-hmms and silence and talked about how she was processing it all as an example of how much silence there was. I took one clip to make into one of my YouTube shorts. And I it was an over like 49 second clip. I took out the silences, the dead spots in between. It became a 21 second clip. I, it was, you know. Trying to talk to someone like that. I mean, you know, they have all the time in the world, I guess. So it doesn't really matter. But come prepared. Don't come as if you're thinking it through on the spot. She should have processed it before going to talk to Leah. It's not like the conversation was a surprise. She knew it was coming. And, you know, she eventually complained about, you know, when she did talk to her about Leah's HOH comp agreement that limited the choices for nominees, but she didn't have any better argument in terms of getting the target off herself. It really seemed like she had never, since she had never had to fight for her own game life before, she just didn't know how to do it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that was a big situation we kind of saw within T-Core was that when they were in positions of power, her or her allies, because here's the thing is, them being that trio, they had a lot of abilities to be in power themselves or by proxy because they had so many connections mm-hmm. there. But they never really tried to use, or t specifically, never tried to use those positions of power to uphold again. If it was, she knew she was safe that week, she was good. She was chill. I think that was a thing I wish I saw a little bit more to strengthen certain bonds with her because I do think if she took one time to strategize a little bit more with Cam, she's in a total different position this week. Her lack of connection to some of those people on the other side, because they liked her, they liked t but they they also knew that t didn't care much about them in a game sense of point. I mean, 
you have to spread the love. And also to your point of how her conversations would go. And I go back and forth on this. I think we'll talk a little bit more on the social mm-hmm. game as well on this oh, point. Yeah. Is that she I love again how she was authentically herself, you yes. know, the way she is, how she conversates and things like that. But strategy point, it became sometimes because she would talk through her thought process with people rather than like you mentioned do it beforehand so mm-hmm. as a player from the posing side it's kind of sometimes some people will really appreciate that you're being so undaltered with me we're talking about some people though will feel like this conversation isn't intentional enough um i think yeah. t core herself would say that hey um it's difficult for me to have these conversations in the first place at times as she's kind of mentioned mm-hmm. that to have these like work through this but at the same time the end result showcases that hey, it doesn't build the bond that you're hoping for. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and then another thing on top of all that, at one point this week, t even got upset at Leah for not seeking her out to talk to her. It's like, no, Leah's the HOH. You're the one who is either going to be nominated or has been nominated. You want to save yourself? You find Leah. It's not like she was hiding. They were all out in the open in janky world. I think it goes back to the fact that she had a difficulty connecting on a strategic level to do actions with people who just weren't with her. You know, I think when we saw a different T-Core as a game went on, because I think we felt that, and I felt watching her, that she's playing a very lay low game, playing the middle, and then she will t- take her time to strike later on, you know, um, because she was building up a really good foundation and she had a good positionally positional power where she was yes she was kind of the head of this trio but she also had a really good truce with the head of the other trio chelsea Mm -hmm. so she set up in a place where hey if you just touch base with each person you should be good to go but she had incredible bonds and she could strategize with those people she had those incredible bonds with but person like leah i think that's the thing is if leah was thrown a bone by her I think there's some magic there. If Angela's thrown a bone by T-Core, I think there's some magic there. You know, we see a player like Kimo, who still, for all his shortcomings in certain ways, he's done his best to strategize with people across the board. So when the time came that a veto needed to be utilized, we saw him have the ability to do that. T-Core, one, didn't have the ability to do that with the other side, but also didn't attempt to do such a thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, And, you know, that continued after she was nominated as she told Angela on Wednesday afternoon that she really hadn't talked to anyone yet. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Rubina was out there. She solidified at least two votes for herself by starting to lobby people while t sat around and waited. Rubina was out there talking about how good t game was and, you know, and her positioning was, while T-Core was, I, well, I don't know what she was doing. Rubina, of all people, was out strategizing T-Core. Come on. No no need for the shade on our girl Rubina. Or, but to your point, I think that's kind of the core of some of the players we've seen this week. And I, I wanted to also preface when I said she wasn't fighting for the veto. She, this was the first week she was put on the block. But the idea for it not to be her be part of the equation when she knew she was at risk. I think the issue primarily is she accepted the role she was already put in. At like kind of like how I felt we talked about Quinn and Tucker, where when eventually when Quinn felt like his game was kind of already gone, like he's just I'm gonna throw against the wall. I'm just gonna do whatever I can and let's see how long how somebody will get me. Tucker felt the same way as well too. I think T Core, she felt that hey, these are my people. I'm close with them. This is my these are my boundaries. This is my wall. Let's just play the game like this. She didn't have the willingness to strategize outside of this box that I feel like she kind of put herself in because she had the ability. We saw her ability to connect with people. They're just like, why aren't you connecting with me? Why aren't you attempting yeah. to do that? So, yeah. Well, and then when she finally did get off her butt and start talking to people, she didn't like that she you know, had to answer questions and stuff. She complained to Rubina that Angela asked pointed questions and others were doing it too. She said she didn't realize she'd have to go over things like her thoughts in the game. Oh, yes. How terrible having to explain yourself as you're trying to avoid eviction. This is what I mean by since it was her first time being nominated, she 
I, I don't understand, though, because she's been through all these weeks. And she still didn't know this is what happens when people get nominated, that they talk and they explain and they answer questions. I, I, I don't know how she didn't know that. Yeah, no, it's it's. I think we really saw it. It's kind of like when you got teams play. Uh, you know, we talk about. I like the NFL references sometimes. Uh, we play them. They don't. They they don't put their main guys in the preseason games. They're like, all right, right they should be fine. Then they start the actual season. They're like, kind of rusty. They don't know what to do, yeah. even though they're incredible players. I feel like that was the issue with Tico this week. She was put on the block. Didn't realize that. Hey, like, yeah, you got to answer these questions. This is. It, it feels like you're being treated like a rookie again, even though she had a position in the house doesn't matter anymore you're on the bottom of the totem pole this week uh, and i think that was very difficult for her because again you have to take yourself out of the ego and i'm not saying tico had a big ego by any means i do think though she felt so comfortable in her position of power that she had so many weeks and she really had plot armor i mean i felt like week in and week out the story was written around her. she was the main character in a sense yeah. that like I'm like, how is she not flat getting any flack? She's making her way there. And for a bit, we were, we talked about T Corp mm-hmm. really has a strong road to the end. But like any good story, you got to have your hero in the place of danger. And this was kind of her week to yeah. rise in and rise out. But what we saw for T Core, it was difficult. The plot armor was gone because she was she was like, Why am I doing this? Why am yeah. I why am I humoring you and answering your questions? Yeah. Now, before we uh, leave this rule, I do want to mention that as the week wore on, the trio started to talk about how they were the good people and they didn't want the bad people to win and blah, blah, blah. We've heard it all before on Big Brother. Uh, She and Rubina talked about how they weren't necessarily cut out for the game and uh, they were going to change the way it was played and they didn't want backstabbing to win. Standard BS we've seen so many times. Even though, of course, t had already backstabbed her allies earlier. Um, I, I guess it didn't count when she did it, but hey, there's no rule against hypocrisy as long as you're not caught. Uh, we're not here to judge that, just whether or not she schemed or plotted. The Big Brother House Man does things to you in a way that you cannot even see the lens. Yeah. I also still remember week one where our, our cast of Big Brother 21 is like, has there been a cast of people who liked each other this much? We're just these we're just <laughs> all good people here. We're all sweet. We take care of one another. So um, unfortunately... That is, definitely, that is definitely what your season is known it for. Was, it was. Everybody it was nice, kind, loving one another. Compassion, just a very kumbaya group of yes. people. And yes. I think, unfortunately, that's kind of, I think. Embracing it's, it's, all the differences among you. Exactly. Loving the cultural differences that we have within us. Yes. Celebrating those differences. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the issue is it's a good guy syndrome, I say sometimes, is that when you feel like you're the heroes in the game, you see yourself as heroes in the game, then you start feeling, you take a moral superiority within yes. this game, which is based on backstabbing, lying. There's, it's nothing right. wrong. There's nothing wrong doing that within the game levels. Because yep. that's what the game was meant for. And here's the thing is, 16 people sign up for this thing. They're trying to win money. That's how the game is supposed to be played. Right. Uh, exactly. So you can't change the rules halfway through. And you shouldn't want to. You shouldn't have to. It's fine. You can be good people and you can not backstep outside the house. In the game, it's part of it. And also, yes. these three have been doing it. Yes. All right. Well, we can move on to the second rule, which says not to scheme and plot too much and to keep your scheming secret. Now, I just mentioned what well, we just discussed, backstabbing. And this rule also says not to do that too soon. One question that has come up was whether t made the move against the collective too early when she and Chemo evicted Cedric. And it's a very difficult question to answer because so much has happened since then, including, of course, them bringing in Rubina as a very strong third member. At the time, it sure seemed like it was too soon and also a misread since Quinn showed he was trustworthy by telling them that information. But in the end, I can't pinpoint it as something that cost her the game. I think she maneuvered through that. Yeah, no, it's a great point. It's like hindsight's twenty twenty. It could have gone yeah. either ways. But the idea that if she didn't do that, that if she didn't try to cut Cedric at that point, she would still be here. I think the butterfly effect would have changed the entire game. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That. And we don't know what side Cedric would have taken. If anything, hindsight's twenty twenty. I think she made the good move. The issue was is I think she forgot that that's the move that kind of set her up in the position she was, that she was, the, mm-hmm. she was the queen that cuts throats. Like you do what you got to do. Um, and understanding people will do that to you. So I wish she still had that knife in her hand yeah. when she was playing with Cedric, because I, at that point I was worried, but you know, looking back, it, it really solidified her in a really strong position of power, but you know, you're going to have people come for your throne and it, Cedric wasn't the only one. He was just yeah. 
a product of it. Right. Yeah. Other than that, you know, I'd say T-Core was fine with most of this rule, except, well, there's this pesky little part that warns against being in an obvious tight duo. Now, often that comes up in the form of a showmance. But as we discussed last week with Quinn, it doesn't have to. It could be any two people. And the funny thing is that in Brooklyn's post eviction interviews, she called out T Core and Chemo as a showmance, just different from any we've ever seen. But they're a pair. This was something that I and many other live feed viewers have been saying as well. And well, now I'm saying it again. But being in an obvious duo wasn't enough. They made it a trio with Rubina and added her as another person to spend all their time with in order to make it even more obvious. Uh, Angela had a funny comment this week uh, when Leah told her T-Core said she didn't want to sit next to Chemo or Rubina on the block. And Angela replied, well, she'd been sitting next to them the whole game. What did she think was going to happen? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing is, is that's the frustrating part is that they had such a strong trio and they made it far within the game. That's very tough to make it into a trio. With a little bit of tweaking, I really think they could have set themselves in a much better position. I mean, mm -hmm. because if you're going to be so overt with this, each of you should have a sub connection to somebody else. And this season was ripe for the pickings of people to bring under them, to connect somebody else. I mean, t -Core did that with Chelsea in such a way. The mm -hmm. other folks, Chemo, Rubina, after Tucker went home, tried to make some other connection. This They group could have been strong and keep going, but right. they were so overt and they made it really matter of fact, hey, we're not really working with y'all. We're good. We're the, we might not be the cool kids club, but we got our club ourselves. Like that's kind of the the idea they portrayed to other people that we're good over here. Um, we'll survive anything. And unfortunately, there's only so many hits you can take. And it really this portion of it could have been mitigated if they took the second step in. If you're gonna have a highlight on around you, make sure you have some warriors between you and the attack lines. Yeah. Now Considering what we discussed in the first rule about T-Core taking so long to talk to Leah and then not doing a good job of fighting for herself, it turns out she did actually hurt her cause uh, by something she said because she tried to get Leah on board with the Women's Alliance idea. At the time, that meant T-Core was okay with chemo going, which was bad enough, you know, to show what she thought about a trusted ally. But that also meant, you know, by, you know, simple logic, that Cam was a target. and. Leah, you know, embellished the story a little bit, perhaps. But, you know, when she passed it along, Cam wasn't very happy with that idea. Leah embellishing a story? No. That would never no. happen on this show. Never. Nope. Uh, yes, I think that was the, I mean, we, we talk about, I, again, I think if she secured the bag with Cam, if she connected, because she knew Chelsea and Cam are close. She's close with Chelsea. If she just took that extra step right there, I mean, that's here's the thing is I don't think she over strategized whatsoever. She she put the right. She should have done more. She should have done. She should have done more. more but she should have kept it secret. You know, part yeah. of this is keep your scheming secret. And when you're in with an obvious trio, there, there ain't nothing secret about that. Yep. Um, in her final speech, she told the other house guests, "When I have your back, I protect you as much as I possibly can." The problem was that everyone knew she only had two backs that she was protecting, and that was Chemo and Rubina. Yeah, I mean, it was just so clear to everybody else. And it, it, it really limits your – see, as you get farther in the game, every week solidifies how strong a trio is. And I think mm -hmm. so many people – I mean, Angela was the biggest person of it here, where she had beef with Quinn the week before. She had beef with uh, Joseph. She realized this trio of people, like, hey, it doesn't matter what promise they send me. I can't believe it. They're going to always pick somebody over right. me. Angela's right. already paranoid, even with her closest ally, with Tucker at that point, was she thought would pick somebody over her. Three people in a trio? Not going to happen. Yeah. All right. Well, the third rule talks about the need to be flexible. How do you think T-Core did here? I mean, can you a brick. A brick right here. It's not moving one way or the other. <laughs> Which, again, we talk about solidified principles. I appreciate t -Core and the way she played her game a lot of ways. The issue is, is that it was flexible for the wrong ways. It was – she didn't allow – other people, she, she was very stringent with how they were. She's like, do what I do to thee, do not do it to me. Um, and that was kind of hypocrisy we talk about. Her flexibility was 
not intentional in the way I believe. So the, here's the issue. She was not working with other people. I mean, Leah is the biggest point factor that if she had conversations to, to, with Leah, I think she could have avoided herself from being blocked. So many times Quinn's targets didn't go home, not because of just t corn dumb. It was just the inability of Quinn to mess, not mess something up. I mean, we see so many situations with t Core right here that if she was able to cross the enemy line, not even the enemy line. They consider her an ally slightly. If she was able to go a little bit more on that side, she could have done something. I think also this week too, the ultimate, well, I always talk about test of flexibility, right? When you are pushed to the brink, when she is next to Rubina, her closest ally, what can you do to keep yourself home, not going home? Not much. She wasn't really campaigning very heavily against Rubina. She also had the numbers on her side if she kind of tried a little bit more, but she just let things be. And I think here's the issue I find is that was it an inability to be flexible or a principle to not be flexible, you know? And I think, you know, and I'm not saying it changes a reason, yeah, right. but I think for her as a player, I don't think she comes back, she changes anything with it. I mean, because that's just how she wants. She doesn't want to be flexible. She doesn't want to yeah. try to work with somebody she doesn't like. I think what it's funny because I, I was going to, you know, maybe ease into it a little and say, oh, I didn't really see her as being terribly flexible. And then you're here with, she was a brick. Uh you know, so I, I, I just appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, we talked about it. She was locked in with Kimo and Rubina. It was clear to everyone where they stood. Um, you know, we saw a scene, Mackenzie talking about it with Cam, say, well, we're not part of that group. It was just so obvious. And yeah, t -Core had been in a few other alliances earlier, but as we discussed, she, she wasn't happy with them because she hadn't gotten to pick the exact members. She really only wanted to associate with those people that she liked the best. And as an ally, I love that. I love that. If you, I was her ally, if you're in that group, you, yeah. Group. But it's, it's, that's the thing is so polarizing, which is so right. when you think of T core as polarizing, you're like, why? But no, that's the reason. Cause she's ride or die for her ally, which is a great friend. I bet outside the house, I, you want yeah. her at your side. But when you're in the house, when you're on the other side of it, it's very difficult to play with yeah. her. All right. Well, this is a good transition to the fourth rule, which says players should not let their emotions control them. Because, of course, making your alliances based almost solely on emotions like friendship goes against this rule. Uh, and I know in Big Brother, you're stuck with people 24 seven for so long. It is tough to think about making alliances with people you don't necessarily love so much. But it's necessary to make use of people like that for your own numbers game. However, T Core showed that. She wasn't doing it and even told Rubina that she was struggling to separate game from personal. Yeah, I think we completely see this where when she falls in love in a not a romantic but platonic way with her people she wants to ride or die from it became so mm -hmm. difficult i mean we see her when she is put on the block and here's the thing is uh, emotions aren't a bad thing right emotions are going to come right. and go um it's the idea of how does that serve your actions and again for t core i don't think she has any regrets in the side she would do it all over again i mean i think it comes trick like very apparent when they ask would you change anything in interviews and she says i think i would just try to win more competitions you know yeah um, it, which it, yeah um her emotions are unfortunately what's kind of let her not be that cutthroat person we saw when she took out cedric we i think we saw and that's the tough thing with a game, a game of big brothers a marathon right so you have these feelings grow more and more for people but i think you know not having any room that she would ever cut rubina or t core just not really you know have a facade that she wouldn't work with them it was right. it, it really hindered her game yeah yeah i i will say that earlier in the game t core did a better job of separating the two you know a good mm -hmm. example is the same thing we talked about turning on cedric who she really did like uh but she believed she needed to move against the collective and Cedric was in the wrong place at the wrong time, so he became her sacrificial lamb. Now, of course, after it happened, she was completely enveloped by her emotions and went off alone uh, with chemo. She couldn't even look at people like Brooklyn. And yeah, it's fine. It's understandable to be upset. But you were the one who blindsided them, not the other way around. Usually, it's someone like we saw Leah last week you know, being upset that she got blindsided and separating herself. No, this was the blindsider being upset. And it, it's just not a good look to pull off a big move like that and then get all sad about it. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it's tough. And again, it's a tough game. And I just think it's one of those things where she knew the right moves, but sometimes I think she just wasn't allowing herself to make those type of moves. Yeah. All right, well, we can go to the fifth rule, which says players need to pretend to be nice and play the social game. Obviously, this is where t -Core was amazing, except she wasn't pretending or playing. It was It was just who she is. It's almost all anyone ever talked about. Uh, Quinn, this is just a few things. Obviously, we could, you know, spend the next hour talking about this. But uh, Quinn, we're not going to. Uh, Quinn told her that she had one of the best social games of all time in the top 30. And he didn't even know if it was intentional or she's such a cool person that she made it look easy. During Joseph's word association for t -Core with Mike Bloom, he called her the best. And, and so on. We especially saw it when she won HOH and everyone was celebrating so much and talking about how much they love her. And this wasn't some sort of fake, like, yay, let's see your HOH room. Yay. No, these people were truly happy for her. It is just not something you see very much in Big Brother. No, you don't see that type of thing. And I think what we saw that excelled her is that she has the ability to connect with anybody in the house the problem was is that who does she choose to do it with you know if you were right. blessed if you got her ability where she wanted to connect with you but then on the other side of it if you didn't get the honor of that your game was actually at a detriment because her social game was so good that other people wouldn't be as close as to you if t -Core wasn't i mean i think that's such a testament to her game and so like you said it's a natural thing i don't think she ever had to put on put it on i don't think she ever had to pretend she was who she was mm -hmm. um but yeah, I mean, it was really cool to see such a social player who didn't really have to, didn't try, which I think also she talks about how she has difficulty uh, well, in right. social elements. But so that's, you know, she really, uh, oh, you know, passed her yardage the way she was playing the game. I mean, it, really talented. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that is funny, you know, what you mentioned, because, you know, Taryn said something similar um, on, on a recent uh, live feed recap that T-Core was one of the least social, social players. And it was something we'd all seen, but, you know, that phrasing condensed it down well, because we saw in the very early days of the game, she actually was having a slow start getting into relationships. She even mentioned to Mackenzie that, She's slower at talking to new people. Even so, Joseph and Chelsea liked her a lot right off the bat, and it just grew from there. She wasn't the type of social player who was running around, making jokes, talking to everyone. She was the type who was generally quiet, didn't talk as much. But when she did talk to someone, there was this kind of real emotional connection that people just felt. And it's funny watching from the outside because we saw a lot of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know people laughed at that but those actually engaging with her clearly bonded to her yeah no it worked she had such a natural talent for it and i think one people can kind of sometimes see fakeness right and other side of things people can see that like authenticness that she brings to the table mm -hmm. when also they realize it's maybe not comes as naturally for her. So I think that combination really put her aside. I mean, her social game is what connected her to all the players in the house and created a strong three. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, she, she, she was, she was incredible at that. Yeah. I mean, until this week, her social game had acted as a, a sort of shield for her in the first rule. We talked about some of her mistakes in terms of strategizing, but those didn't come back to bite her in large part because of her, you know, social shield. And speaking of shields, at one point recently, Rubina even told t -Core she felt like she and Kimo were t -Core shields in the game. And to a large extent, she was right. But the funny thing is, even with that knowledge, Rubina was still perfectly happy to continue their friendship and their game relationship. People kept wanting to weaken t -Core, but not take that direct shot at her. Mm -hmm. Even this week, it took a particular set of circumstances to make it happen with Leah promising safety to two others, plus Angela Vito and chemo, you know, all that had to happen before Leah felt like she had to nominate mm -hmm. T core. And even then she still thought T core would be safe. 
I mean, is all the situation. I think this is a good lead up to our next rule where this is what created t into such a threat at yes. the end of the game. Um, she was able to have this plot armor where we're like, no one sees her as a threat, really. They just love her until at this point when the game gets slower and slower. And then people realize, wow, her ability of social game is so strong that – I don't know if I can beat this. I don't know if I can match up against her. Do I really want to go to a final two, especially when she has two people next to her are one going to vote for her no matter what, but right. also might throw their game under the bus for her. So, I mean, it's a double-edged sword because the way she wielded, in the game, wielded it within the game was an incredible way, but at the same time, when she didn't bless others with those connections of socialness, it came back to become, hey, if you're not with me, you're against me. Yeah, I mean, if one person in the game has that much of an aura around them, mm -hmm. then people should, in theory, recognize it and do something about it. This is Big Brother, so, you know, sometimes they don't. But, and for a while, it, it was certainly looking like that might be the case with her. Even this week, like I just said, the idea of voting her out kind of slowly percolated because everybody kept thinking nobody would do it until they finally talked, like, a lot. You know, like one would say, you know, we saw on, on TV, Mackenzie would say to Cam, well, I'd like to vote her out, but I don't think uh, Chelsea will do it. And I'm not sure you'll do it. And Cam's like, well, I'd do it, but I don't know. You know, and it, it just kept slowly making its way through. Um, and once they all compared notes, they realized they all had similar opinions of her. Yes, they love her, but also they all love her and in the fifth rule i just mentioned how everyone was celebrating when she won hoh and talking about how much they loved her what i didn't mention was the rest of my note that i had taken from that which said remember this if she makes it to the end luckily for the other house guests they realized it before she could make it to the end very true. I mean, if she makes it to the end right there, I mean, I think they're laying out the groundwork that T-Core is a winner right here. Yeah. And every and she was in such a strong positional power where she has that three every week exponentially. She gets stronger and stronger. The person who was really gaveling this guy, Angela, she was the one who had been calling out against the whole world saying this three needs to be taken down. I don't think if Angela is the one trying to keep beating this drum, we see these other players take the shot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I said, there were a number of conversations that led to this one. I mean, besides the ones you're talking about with Angela, but another was uh, Mackenzie saying it would be better for everyone's game to get rid of T-Core and adding, if people aren't seeing that, then they're dumb. Uh, and, and, you know, she, she said that people need to get away from the personal. Stop thinking about how nice t -Core is. All true. Cam also said t -Core is the bigger threat than Mc... Is the bigger threat. And Mackenzie told him that if they don't vote her out, t -Core will win this thing. Even Chelsea was saying it as recently as a few days ago. Uh, telling Leah how dangerous t -Core is and how she'd make it to the end and win. Yes, Chelsea changed her mind a couple times this week, or at least outwardly changed her mind. Uh, but, you know, in that assessment, whether she was telling her version of the truth or not, it was absolutely on target. Yeah, I mean, I think all around, we just kind of see this coming back to get her. And, I mean, I guess the question is, is that do you feel like this was prompted by her trust in Rabina? And chemo, or was it the opposite of that? Uh, well, I mean, it, that's hard to say. I mean, one thing I did want to talk about in, in terms of targeting people as threats was Leah's choice in nominees. Mm -hmm. You know, because one thing that I, I've seen a lot of discussion from, I've I've gotten comments on my YouTube shorts and TikToks, was Leah should have gone after the Chelsea trio instead of the T-Core trio. And while there is some validity to that, and it's certainly worth a debate, especially at the beginning of the week, I think by the end of the week, we saw why t -Core's group was more of a threat than Chelsea's. Yeah. Which kind of goes to your question. Yeah. Um, because while t -Core, Chemo, and Rubina uh, would never turn on one another and always vote as a unit, some cracks might have been showing up in Chelsea's group. 
you know, we discussed earlier how McKenzie had appeared to wake up a bit. And one thing she's seen is that what's good for Chelsea is not always good for her, which is why she stood her ground this time. Not to mention all the bickering between Chelsea and Cam that could potentially have game implications. Of course, we're not here to discuss that situation, but it's worth mentioning because it helps to show why t was the bigger threat because of how locked in they were. Like I said earlier, Rubina knew she was t shield and was still happily going along with it, and Chemo seemed to as well. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, this threat level is increased too because of not just yourself, but the connections you have in there. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I feel like um, I, I, going into the next rule, unless you had something else you want to mention it here. I, I do. Oh. I, I do. Uh, because I, I, I do want to mention, you know, the trio has been seen by others for weeks now. I mean, t herself said they survived longer than any other trio in the game, and they'd been together for a while, but it took a long time for other players to realize it. The thing is... T Core and company did a terrible job in managing their threat level. Yes, it took longer than it should have for others to target them. But despite what T Core thought, it wasn't that they were totally off the radar. People just had other priorities. It's it's like they thought they were invisible or they just didn't understand what it meant to be seen as a threat. You know, Chemo said just this week that they weren't a threat because they didn't win comps. Rubina said this week to Leah that they weren't a threat, they were an opportunity. Both of them were simply wrong. And within that trio, t was the biggest and clearest threat of them all. Yeah, very much so. And and that's why I was going to say that I think it's connected to that she's almost, for me, the, she trusted them too much. And people knew that. Um, this idea that uh, she had full faith in both uh, Kimo Rubina was known to everyone else. That if she honestly could show a little bit more distrust in either of them, I think the other players would have felt like there was a crack. There was a fracture that they could at least work with T coordinated again. I also think it's very surprising. I think it's her social game, but that Chelsea believed that T core could be somebody super beneficial for her as the game goes yes. on because she will be an ally. I don't think that was completely the case. And I, in fact, I think that. Uh, she was missed in a way, um, but the other players were not. Yeah, and I think you're, you know, you're looking at uh, moving into the seventh rule here about trusting those two too much. Um, I mean, we know T Corp broke the trust of Quinn to flip the house earlier, um, but as far as her trusting other people, yeah, obviously she trusted Chemo and Rubina a hundred percent. She was right to. Uh, because to bring it up again, Rubina knew she was being used as a shield and still say super close. Uh, yes, Rubina finally lobbied on her own behalf when they were up against each other on the block. But that wasn't breaking trust. It was just trying to stick around. I can't think of any other people she really trusted beyond her trio. Maybe Chelsea, like you said. But it, you have an interesting twist on it that by trusting them so much, other people looked at that and said, hmm, we have a problem here. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those partial parts of the rule where it's kind of almost, in a way, opposite. That we're like, hey, you know, don't trust almost nobody. But at this point, we actually want you to trust a few other players or at least yeah. fiend the trust, you know? Right. I think that was the thing. She was not covert in her ability of trusting these players. And the contrast was very shown. I think yeah. also people probably saw her interactions with Quinn or afterwards from his conversations too, that like, it doesn't matter what you're telling t if you're not on her like list of people she wants to work right. with, nothing you can tell her will keep you in the good races. I mean, but these players also think that Angela will change her ways too. They try to th- do things, but it doesn't. So maybe yeah. they don't, uh, for her though, t they learned. Yeah. All right. Well, we can go to appendix a, which is the jury phase of the game and deals with both how t will impact the final outcome, plus whether the other remaining players did what they needed to to get her on their side at the end. We've already discussed how important it was for everyone to get her out because she was seen as such a big jury threat and everybody loves her, not to mention that Kimo and Rubina, if they were on the jury, would be automatic votes in her favor. But on the flip side, she is also an automatic vote for Kimo or Rubina if either of them make it the final two. And the other of that duo who doesn't make it is probably also an automatic vote. So that means the remaining players really need to make sure that neither Kimo nor Rubina 
get to the end unless they're damn sure those two votes will be the only ones they get. I personally don't like those odds. Yeah, it's a very interesting situation where now it's you've gone to the point where you have this strong trio with a smaller jury, mm-hmm. and now you knock out T-Core, but oh, wait, we got to get Chemo, or now we got to get Rubina. And oh, here's the thing is when they all go, they're probably most likely voting for a block too. So who yep. do they appreciate the game with? So now you're in a situation where maybe someone like Chelsea, mm-hmm. who worked with her in that way, you know, it might come to help her out later on. She has three votes there. Leah, who took out T-Corp, does she appreciate her game? I'm not sure. It's a very interesting situation where it's like, at this point, we probably need to do it one way or the other. Like, And is it that you keep somebody like Chemo around because, hey, he will get two votes, but the trio is not voting for three people together. It's a confusing situation that you're now figuring mm-hmm. out because you're too late in the game, but somebody like Leo is like, hey, I need to make this shot happen. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's that led to the game where we, we need to get T-Core out because also if we don't get T-Core out, she's got these jury votes. I think people realize Joseph's probably appreciated her in some shape or form uh, game-wise. Oh, quit, excuse me. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Joseph made didn't make the cut. Yeah. Um, well, and that and, was exactly it because yeah. when they were debating whether or not to, to evict Joseph, a lot of people said, a lot of people watching were like, you just let a tight trio get to jury. Yeah. You know, and now we're seeing that where, you know, you mentioned Chelsea. I think Chelsea is the most likely pick for the trio if she makes it to the end. Um, you know, especially after in Chelsea's goodbye message, she emphasized that she tried to save her. And then, you know, Tcor told Mike Bloom, Chelsea is someone that I value as much as Chemo and Rubina in this game. And, you know, I I mean, I do think anyone who goes to the end with Chelsea is likely going to lose anyway. But especially if there's already three votes on Chelsea's side. Very much so. And it's this weird game that you do the numbers, right? All right. So, well, we want to get Chelsea out because she gets the votes. But if we don't get Rubina and Kimo out, those are the votes going that way. So, you're like, all right, order of uh, Rubina, uh, Kimo. Oh, now we have to get Chelsea. Okay, so that means I can only work with basically, say, if you're McKenzie, you have like very few options there. Yeah. Or if you're Leah, you, so you do the math game and you're like, oh, that's final three here. Now I'm stuck with these people. So it's interesting how this crafts the wall of people you have to work with. And, uh, you, you know, but I mean, this is a shot you probably have to take now or later. Right. Uh, so it, it's one of those things that you, you got to figure it out as you go. So I think this appendix, this position of the rule, this last one, is most interesting in t Corps' case because mm-hmm. I think the implications of her jury vote and her her uh, impression on the jury, either if she's on it or off it, yeah. make a big difference. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, you, you probably, uh, everybody probably heard the news that Dr. Will will not be doing the jury roundtable now. Have they called you yet, Ovi? Ha, ha, has CBS Productions called you? Uh, you yet? know what? I'm, I'm under NDA, David. There's okay. only so much I can there. You know, as okay. a person of a lot of prowess in this game, with uh, they, they've been watching us over and over again, and they love all our segments from the Julie Chen Moon vs. Yeah. Long statement. They're like, can we bring that there? But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. You might see okay. my face on there. You might not. So Okay. All right. Well, it's about time to wrap things up. So what are your final thoughts about your winner pick, t Uh, You know, it was an up and down week. Very up when Quinn went home because I did like yeah. Quinn. I said that. <laughs> but because of uh, I was happy that I got one up on David. And then before then, I knew my own was coming there. My Icarus, my rise and fall. Uh, to speak on t herself, though. What a fun player to watch. What's a personality that we saw in the game? Somebody who truly charmed the people within the house and outside the house, too. Because I think as an audience, we really loved watching her in so many ways. But at the same time, I think it was difficult to watch her in so many ways because we saw her be very select in the way she used her abilities. From the initial parts of the game where she played a lay-low game that you're expecting a certain way for her to ride the middle and then come to take her queen position to when we finally saw what we thought the Phoenix was risen when she took out Cedric. Were we sure that move was right? No, but we're like, this is exciting. This is how the game is supposed to be played. Then what we see is her create an army around her. Her have a plot armor. She seems like she is the leader. She is the main character of a Game of Thrones-esque big brother. So then when we finally see her, wait, hold on. Why is there filler episodes? Why is this game, why is she doing nothing? Why is she not taking the power in her own hands to enact change in here? In certain ways, we did see that happen. But eventually, you can only send 
so many people home until it comes back for you. So when we see her in a position of less power, where she is a threat to other people, how does she play the game? And unfortunately, we did not see the same level of cutthroatness that we saw earlier in her game. I mean, again, I think she kicked over her yardage in the way she played her social game because she self-professed that was not going to be something that she would be completely focusing on because she was nervous. She had that anxiety, as she says. Um, I think she did really well in there, but unfortunately – I think it was principles or decisions she chose not to work with people who were outside of her main prior of her group. Uh, really loved her. I think she was great. But also, this is as far as she went. She went home because she did not stray away. And she was not more flexible than a brick. <laughs> so love yeah. her. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody Kinda knew that t -Core had an amazing social game. I don't know if anyone has been so beloved by all the players on Big Brother while the game was still ongoing, other than, of course, your cast. Um, her strategic game, however, was not as great. There's a reason I always say rule one is the most important, because no matter how much other people love you, they usually eventually realize that's going to mean you're going to beat them at the end. Yes, t -Core made some moves and had a big impa impact on the way the game went. But as time went on, she also tended to keep more to herself and her trio rather than getting more involved in maneuvering the game to her advantage or ensuring that she and her allies were safe. Too many times we saw her talking about what she was going to say to people and, and then not saying it to the point that it just became a running gag outside the house. It was even recognized inside the house a bit. In her final week, t -Core had every opportunity to make a concentrated effort to save herself and maybe even flip her allies from nomination. After all, that was their plan, to get Leah to their side after Chelsea and company blindsided her to take out Quinn. But no, she let Chelsea get her hooks back into Leah and keep her focused on the trio instead of the woman behind the curtain. Even after her allies were nominated, even after she was nominated, t -Core was still slow to lobby on her own behalf. By the time she did, others had gotten the ball rolling downhill to evict her. There was still some attempted pushback. There were some bumps in that hill. But even that came more strongly from Chelsea than it did from t -Core herself. Of course, she became a target because of her leadership of the obvious trio and the overall threat they and she posed. t -Core herself told Dalton Russ, I know strategically being showy about my friendship with Rubina and Chemo was going to kick my butt in the end eventually at some point. But I don't regret these those friendships that I was able to foster and that trust I was able to build with them through that relationship. And it's very nice that she has that friendship. But she was right about it kicking her butt in the game itself. Indeed, after t -Course saw her goodbye messages, she told Julie and us that coming in, she, she said she really wanted to make friends. And she did. That's great. Really. But Big Brother is a game. And we aren't here to talk about why Blank made friends. Indeed, her making all those friends was a big part of the problem as other players were able to do something t -Core herself had a hard time with, separating game from emotions to make the smartest move for themselves. The lone exception was probably Chelsea, but eventually she had to do it too so she could keep her own allies as it became clear she wasn't going to convince them otherwise. t -Core's threat level, due to her social game and her tight allies, had been a bright, big, flashing red light in front of them for a while now. And they all finally paid attention. That is why t -Core lost. Very well said, David. Very Thank well said. You. Uh, all right. Well, we will have our spoiler-free predictions in a moment and a few other pieces of information uh, as well. In addition... Though, if you want our full spoilery thoughts, we're all over social media. Yes, don't forget, both of, us, both of us are very active on different number of social media platforms where we discuss Big Brother and now Survivor and many other topics. On Twitter, I'm at the OV Kabir. On Instagram, I'm at OV Kabir. And on TikTok, I'm at Basmati Boy. David is truly all over the place, but there are a few ways you can track him down. You can find all his various accounts through his link tree at 
linktree slash David Bloomberg. Or you can find him on Twitter and Blue Sky at, at David Bloomberg and on Threads, Instagram, and all other video flat platforms like TikTok and YouTube. You can find him at, at David Bloomberg TV. Right now, he's doing basically double duty as he's a survivor in Big Brother. So please give him a hand. Show him the support because I know he is losing sleep, but he's doing yes. a great job at it. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have been posting at least three, often more videos per day on, you know, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Uh, they're, they're still mostly about Big Brother, the show, the live feeds. Uh, of course, Survivor is starting to be built into those now. I have some on those. Um, even some, you know, still have some from The Anonymous, uh, a couple from The Circle. So, you know, sprinkling in those others among the mass of the Big Brother and Survivor ones. Uh, so, yeah, again, you can, you know, find everything at my link tree there. Uh, prediction time. As I mentioned, every week, these are spoiler free. So, you know, uh, I wrote them up before I knew what the outcome of the HOH comp was. Uh, in this case, we saw a tiny bit of the comp at the end of the live show. And what we saw was that Angela had the most solid base for her stacking. The thing is, it's a long competition. It was an hour long competition. Literally anything could happen still with nothing else to go on. What the heck? I'll predict she wins HOH and decides to go after the other trio of Chelsea, Cam and mm -hmm. McKenzie. After all, she just vetoed chemo, so it wouldn't make sense to put him back on the block. Not that all of Angela's decisions exactly make sense. Uh, but still, I think she'll nominate Chelsea and Cam, and one way or another, by the end of the week, Cam will be the one who goes. Hmm. But it's a double eviction week. And if my prediction is right, Angela will then be vulnerable. Plus... Some people had talked about wanting to get rid of her in a double eviction because that way they wouldn't have to listen to her complaining all week long. So I think someone like Mackenzie or Chelsea will win HOH in the double and oh. immediately turn around to go after Angela. If it's Mackenzie, I don't necessarily think that's the right move for her game. But I think if the first part of my prediction is correct, she'll be upset about the cam vote and want Angela gone. And this time, I think they'll finally succeed. So my prediction is Cam and Oh, Angela. interesting. So I am flip-flop. I think actually our girl, our Awoken Queen, most likely McKenzie, will win this. And there's no smarter decision for her to do is to take out the final two of those people, Rubina and Chemo. I think she goes after those two, cleans it up, because that's what she should be doing. After that, I think... I probably i i think there's a strong because she they know they need the votes are going to be there for them the jury votes right. are I mean, we, we just talked about that but there's also still chelsea you there's know. chelsea but i think because with mckenzie's connected with leah yeah. cam and angela so yeah. i think she knows that chelsea wouldn't have the votes right now so she goes after those two gets one of them out there we yeah. have a flip-flop i think our queen angela wins and i think then she goes for the head of chelsea because she wants to have okay. the other votes in chemo so i think we see potentially rubina and chelsea go home and it opens up the playing field for the other folks okay wow all right well we'll see if either of us are even close and with that in mind, as we wrap up, I want to make sure and encourage everyone to check out our RJP Patreon program at robhasawebsite.com slash patron. Rob has several patron-only podcasts for Big Brother, plus other perks like the Facebook group and Discord. You can help support shows like ours and everything on the network by becoming a patron at robhasawebsite.com slash patron. Yes, and make sure you're subscribed to all of the RHAP podcasts by going to our YX Lost feed page or subscribe directly to all of the newly rebranded RHAP We Know Reality TV podcasts by going to WeKnowRealityTV.com. See, you people think that these things never change, but look at that big change here in, in, in our text. Um, but you could go to WeKnowRealityTV.com, select your podcast service of choice, and you know, you'll not only find content like us and the daily live feed updates, but also Survivor and a number of other shows and topics. Uh, speaking of some of those shows and topics, uh, Jessica Lewis and I will be recording our first Survivor 47, Why Blank Lost, Saturday morning with special guest Jake O'Kane from Survivor 45. So as we've mentioned, I will be pulling double Why Blank Lost duty for a little while longer here. 
And finally, we want to thank Scott St. Pierre, Jessica Sterling, and the whole RJP and Reality TV wrap ups behind the scenes team for all the work they do editing and putting everything else out there. We really appreciate everything they do to get our voices from our microphones to your ears. And you know, I have to thank all the watchers, the viewers. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. It's been a crazy season, season of Big Brother, and I think it's going to continuously get crazier and crazier. Let us know your thoughts. What do you feel like Tico could have done to stay? Do you disagree with our rules of how she broke them, or do you think that, hey, she did everything she could do. We want to know it all. Let us know on social media, here in the comments. And all, as always, thank you, David, for your wonderful commentary. I mean, killing it as always. Thank you. And thanks to you, Obi, for another great episode. Uh, everyone watch for my Survivor Why Blank Law Saturday. And then we'll be back next week with a double eviction episode of the podcast. We double. will see you then. Bye.